Support for this episode of Judaism Unbound comes from the Ashman Family JCC in Palo Alto, California, whose vision is to be the architects of the Jewish future. The Ashman Family JCC empowers you to experience Jewish paths toward a life of joy, purpose, and meaning through innovative Jewish learning and wellness programs, community building, and initiatives to develop the next generation of Jewish leaders. Learn more at www.paloaltojcc.org. This is Judaism Unbound, episode 416, Loaves of Torah. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rofberg. And today we are going to make you very hungry because our guest today, Vanessa Harper, is the author of a brand new book called Loaves of Torah, Exploring the Jewish Year Through Challah. And who doesn't love challah? Vanessa Harper's book explores the ins and outs of the entire Torah through a mixture of written commentary and bread baking. Before we get into that, just a quick reminder that we are in the middle of registration season for our latest batch of full semester on yeshiva courses. Those are 12 week courses that give you a chance to take a deep dive into one of five really interesting and fascinating topics. One of those classes is me teaching it with Miriam Turlenchamp, and it's called Judaism Inbound. It's an introduction to Judaism class that is the kind of class that people converting to Judaism might find interesting and valuable. But of course, many people who are born Jewish also are looking for an introduction to Judaism class that comes from the Judaism Unbound perspective. So if either of those descriptions describes you, That's a course that we think you're really going to enjoy, and we're going to enjoy meeting you and learning together. The other classes include Lex, who is going to be teaching a course looking at the wild and ancient book called Jubilees, and also three other teachers, Yosef Rosen, Laura Duhan Kaplan, and Kashira Halev Fife, making a return appearance. The three of them are teaching incredibly fascinating classes on Jewish ecology, biblical animals, and the flow of Jewish time. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, just pause the podcast right now, head over to judaismunbound.com slash classes, sign up, and come right back. Now let's go back to the urgent issue that's making all of you extremely hungry, challah. Our guest today is Vanessa Harper, who again is the author of a beautiful book called Loaves of Torah, Exploring the Jewish Year Through Challah. The book is based on her Instagram account, which is called Lech Lechala, where she went through the entire cycle of Torah portions and baked a challah that in some way interpreted or represented that Torah portion and posted the beautiful picture of the challah that she made on Instagram. And we're excited to have a conversation today about the book, about how one might use challah or any other kind of creative act as a way of interpreting and thinking about the Torah and lots of topics in between. So we're really thrilled to be jumping into this conversation. First, just a few words of introduction. Vanessa Harper serves as Senior Director of Adult Jewish Living at Temple Beth Elohim in Wellesley, Massachusetts. And she also serves as the Reform Rabbi in Residence at Gann Academy in Waltham, Massachusetts. Vanessa Harper has been named to the New York Jewish Week's 36 Under 36 list, and she received rabbinic ordination from the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in New York. Vanessa Harper, welcome to Judaism Unbound. It's so great to have you. Thank you so much. A real pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So let's do a little bit of a locating ourselves in this book. I think when I received the book, I first of all, you you open this book and it's absolutely beautiful. There's, I don't know, how, do you know off the top of your head how many pictures of Hala there are, like 100, something like that? Oh, this is a good question. It's something like, I'm going to guess between 100 and 120. So let's call it 110. I actually haven't counted. I should do that. Over 100, the safe marketing way to do it. <laughs> over 100. There are over 100 pictures of beautiful challahs of all kinds of varieties. And I imagined when I saw this book, I imagined that on each chapter, there was going to be like a, a little explanation of what this challah means and how you make this challah. And that's not what's in the book. That's not what's in the text <laughs> of the book. So can you talk a little bit about what this book is from your perspective, what it's trying to do? Absolutely. So let's start with the what the book is not, um, because I think that is actually a very common misconception. 
I spent a long time working on this book and everyone was always like, oh, when your cookbook comes out. And I was like, it's not a cookbook. It's a book of Torah commentary. So it is at its heart, a book of Torah commentary. Um, cooking up Jewish meaning more than cooking up bread. Nice. Yes. Cooking up Jewish meaning. And and there is a lot of bread. Um, and the breads themselves, the, the halot, plural of challah, are each part of the Torah commentary itself. So each one of these halot that opens up each chapter is an interpretation, my own interpretation of something coming out of that Parsha, that Torah portion. But that's just an invitation into what comes next in each chapter. So we have the the uh, the Chala, the interpretive or Midrashic image. And then there's a short bit of commentary on either the Torah portion or there are also holidays and the months of the Jewish calendar in here. So each chapter starts with the challah. We get a short bit of commentary. And then the really useful stuff, I think, is a series of questions for discussion and also creative prompts. There is a recipe in the back. There are a couple recipes that you can use, but I've actually really intentionally not told you how to make these designs um, because for me, that's not really the purpose. It's not to be able to copy the pomegranate challah that I made or the hamsa or the jar of pouring water. The idea is for the reader to be able to look at Torah in a new way um, and to be inspired to create their own interpretations, not just to copy mine. One of the things that I share usually when I'm telling the story of this book is I'm a rabbi now, but earlier in my career, I was a preschool teacher. One of the most important things that I learned as a preschool teacher was uh, from the philosophy of Reggio Emilia, it's a, an early childhood pedagogy, that basically says that every person is born with hundreds and hundreds of different creative languages. And a lot of these get discouraged out of us as we go through a traditional schooling system. And we get really good at things like reading and writing and speaking, but we often lose languages like clay and movement and paint. Those are languages. They're ways of expressing ourselves. For me, I happen to figure out that my language through which I best express my creativity happens to be holodo, um, that that's my medium, but it may not be for everybody. And so that's part of the idea is to invite people, especially adults who've lost touch with a lot of those languages, to find something that speaks to them and offers a different lens, a different way into engaging with Torah, or I'll even say playing with Torah. What I really liked about your Torah commentary, that is also a Chala manifestation commentary, <laughs> I liked that it's, I'm going to say something that's going to sound unbelievably obvious, but this book recognizes that it is a book that is used by people for things. I think a lot of books don't really base themselves on the fact that they will be used and channeled and mobilized by people to do things. It's just like you sort of receive it and then whatever you do, whatever your action steps are. Okay, so I've got a Torah. I mean, let's take other Torah and commentaries. Let's not take like all books. Torah commentaries absolutely are used. They're used, you know, the easiest example might be people writing sermons or divrei Torah and giving them to communities. But most Torah commentaries, I'm going to venture, I guess, and say almost all Torah commentaries I have familiarize myself with, they don't have a section at the end of each Parsha that's like, and here's how you mobilize this if you're an individual person. Here's how you mobilize this if you're leading a community. Here's how you mobilize this if you, like, you do have that section. You have mm -hmm. ideas for how to do that. And I'm going to emphasize what Dan said, because the danger of that is that people will think the point of this book is just, here are the finite list of ways you can mobilize a certain set of chalas in mm -hmm. Jewish life or in your personal life. That's not what you're doing. I think you're planting a seed for people to, in general, relate to Torah and then think, oh, how do I channel this? I'm, I'm flashing actually to, um, I'll throw the link in the show notes, but there's somebody out there a number of years ago, they probably are still operating, who had nail art for every single Torah portion. Oh that, yeah, Midrash Manicures. Midrash Manicures, thank you. So they're in the show notes for people who want to learn. Like, there's always a danger in having you or them or some particular example as a guest on the show, because people think the point of the episode is like, oh, wow, challah commentary. 
The future of Judaism is nil commentary. Right. Like, but the the point of this is this is a framework for how all of us, whatever our interests are, could read a Torah portion and channel it into the world. So like that that was a lot of stuff. But basically, it doesn't surprise me you're an educator because you're thinking about how this book is used. So since I just ranted about it, how it, do you envision that this book is actually used by people and how does that come through in the way you formatted the book? Well, thank you for, first of all, for like noticing that and lifting that up. <laughs> that makes me really happy because that is that is exactly what I am trying to do with this book. The point of this book for me was I wanted it to be something that was usable. And in the introduction to the book, I do share a little bit of different ways it can be used for educators, for families, for individuals who are using the books for different things. It may be using the using the image as a conversation starter in Torah study or in a classroom to try to do a little bit of interpretive work on the image as one of the one of the forms of commentary we might bring, let's say, on a source sheet. Uh, one thing that one could do with the book is to open to the chapter for the Torah portion of the week or for a holiday that's coming up to read the short commentary that I've given, to look at some of the questions, the prompts, um, and as a, an individual to do a little bit of thinking of creative work, um, or as a, a family, even with children, this book does aim a little bit more adult. Um, there are some of the creative prompts. I think kids actually have an easier time with creative prompts than adults do. <laughs> They're a little less inhibited. And so that that can be kind of a family project, again, works well in a, in a classroom setting. And part of the thought is that in each of these chapters, that there are many, many ways into Torah. And that's part of a bigger meta, meta picture that I'm trying to convey as well. Torah, traditionally, we say Torah has 70 faces, um, that there are all these different facets, different different ways in. And the more different lenses that we can apply, the more we get out of Torah that we might not have expected. I wanted to understand a little bit about how you became a Torah commentator with Chala. Like, what was the story that led you from a regular person to a hollow commentator? The short version of the story is it was a total accident. The longer version of the story is I had always been a baker, but never made bread my whole life. My mom was scared of bread, so she didn't teach me how to make it. I didn't pick up bread making until I was in my first year of rabbinical school, which for Hebrew Union College, the first year of school is in Jerusalem. And I'm living in this apartment. I don't have a stand mixer. So, oh no, how am I going to bake all the things that I would normally bake? I need to learn how to make something with my hands. So challah seems like a good start. So I start making challah. And by the next year, when I've moved to New York for my second year of school, um, at this point, I've started to see a couple of, you know, cool rainbow halot online. I've just like seen them scroll by on my feed. And I was like, oh, that's kind of a cool idea, but it's a lot of work. Like, why would I do that for just me and my husband? And it just so happens that there was a Shabbaton, kind of a, a gathering for my rabbinical and cantorial class that fell on the week of Parshat Noah, the week when we read the story of Noah, which ends with the, the beautiful rainbow covenant, um, which God's not going to destroy the world through a flood again. And so I was like, OK, this is the week. If we're going to do a rainbow challah, it's here. And I've got like 20 people, so it's worth it. So I make my rainbow challah and dividing my dough into four different sections and dyeing each one of them. It is in fact a pain, but I make this lovely rainbow challah. I bring it to the gathering. Everyone's ooing and eyeing. And one of my teachers turns to me and says, Vanessa, do you match your challah to the Torah portion every week? And in the split second before I answered, my brain went to, okay, what is the most difficult Torah portion I can think of? Tazria Mitzora. Tazria Mitzora is the one that if you get it for your B'mitzvah, like, oh no, poor you. It's like periods and pus and skin disease. It's gross. Famously, by the way, that was supposed to be my bar mitzvah portion, but my mom was so offended by it that she changed the date of my bar mitzvah. I think it's a good Torah Excellent. portion just for what it's worth. But I but I do agree that it's grimy and tough. Oh, there's yeah. good stuff in there. But like if you're 13, that's that's rough. Um, and if you're trying to create a challah out of it, also a little bit rough. So I was trying to figure it out. I was like, OK, what would I do? I was like, oh, all right, I'll do some like slivered almonds on top like that. That feels like it works. OK, great. So I had an answer. So I opened my mouth and I'm like, yeah, that's a thing that I do. And then I had to go do the thing. And it really started as a personal project. It was it was just for me. It was a way for me to to hold myself accountable to really studying the Torah portion every week. And again, to bring in a, a different lens, to look at the text in a way that I wouldn't look at it the same way, to write a Devar Torah or to teach a class. And 
I started posting the the challah pictures to Instagram. I hadn't even used Instagram yet at that point, but it just seemed like the right place to collect these things. And suddenly people started following along. I was like, oh, okay, cool, great. And so I started adding a little bit of commentary to explain what was going on, like what verse was this based on, what was happening, and acquired a following. One of the things I kind of found over the course of this project is the images really draw people in. They're that first point of access. And then people stayed for the Torah. So they came for the challah, they stayed for the Torah. And that's, that's eventually how this commentary project and using these images as a way of not only an act of interpretation for myself, but then as an educational tool for others. That's how it really got started. Total accident, but a happy one. Love it, um, especially because Noah was my bar mitzvah Torah portion. And indeed, oh, at my first meeting with the rabbi about Torah portions, he literally said to me, some people get really terrible Torah portions, like Tazria Mitzora, the skin disease one. You're lucky you don't have that one. You have Noah's Ark, which is very, he didn't say sexy. I was 12, but like, it's sexy. People know the story. It's, you know, it's a narrative. It's nice. But so examples, let's give some people examples that, you know, the people want it. The people need it. Talk to us about specific fun chalas. Um, I was just before this recording session schmoozing with my mom and my wife about what I was about to talk about. And they were like, oh, that's so cool. And I showed them, I, I just, I was in the, the Kindle version of the book and I just like went to basically random pages. I started with Noah, which was not random because I read the intro and it said that the, the rainbow chala of Noah was kind of the, the starting point. And they immediately saw that they're like, Oh, like the, is that the rainbow, rainbow from the Noah story? One of the next ones I pulled up was Joseph's Technicolor dream code. Although, you know, we could talk about whether the text says Technicolor, but your challah is indeed Technicolor and gorgeous. And they immediately <laughs> saw it. And I didn't tell them what Torah portion it was. They're like, oh, that's Joseph and the coat. And then I did some other ones and they had no idea, which is great. Mm -hmm. Because I think that it's kind of fun that for some of these, it's very intuitive, like, oh, that's a, that's a well-known moment in the Torah that is encapsulated in a beautiful challah. Some of them colored, some of them just, you know, bread, that's the color of bread. One that I really loved as I was flipping to random pages, shalach lecha, you have this, you, which is when the 12 spies go to, to check out Canaan. I thought it was, I like laughed at it, but it was also beautiful. There's this little tiny boy. There's this like little, little mm -hmm. tiny stick figure. And then there's like a really big bunch of grapes. I mean, it's challah, but like it's challah in the shape of grapes and a little tiny, little tiny person. But I thought that was gorgeous because it was, I mean, somebody could look at that and be like, oh, cool, fun, little person with a bunch of grapes. That could be a totally fine takeaway. The other could be, wow, this is clearly a commentary on the fact that in this Torah portion, the 12 spies, or at least 10 of them, say that... We felt like grasshoppers. We felt like tiny little people compared to these giants. And so even, even the grapes, which are, you know, little grapes on a tree, they're much bigger than the person. And it felt to me like that had to be intentional by you. And is everybody who looks at that challah going to receive that message? Not necessarily. You didn't do the thing of, and here's what the challah means. But for those of us who do, it's kind of cool. So I'd love to hear, like, what are some other fun examples that help show us the power of using some creative license and having fun with making challahs related to the Torah? Oh, cool. I love that you, um, that you picked up shlach lecha too. That one's, um, it was so much fun because this was this is a little tangent for a second. This is one of the cases where I create a shape. I'm putting in some amount of intention and energy into the shape. But also there's another partner in this creative process, which is the dough itself. One of the things that I think is really, really cool about working with challah dough as an artistic medium is that it's not entirely in your control in the way that like a pencil can precisely render what you're trying to create. Challah dough is alive. It's got yeast in it, which is a living thing. Um, and it's reacting to what's going on in its environment. It's going to react to the heat of the oven. And so what I shape and put into the oven is not exactly what's going to come out of the oven. It's kind of like working in Chavruta in partnered study with a text um, that you're kind of keeping each other in check, but everyone's adding something different to the conversation and you get to a place that you wouldn't have necessarily otherwise. So this challah, I did have the intention of creating a much larger bunch of grapes than the little tiny person who's looking up at it in awe in that I do love that moment of where they they feel like grasshoppers. They felt like we must have looked like grasshoppers to them. 
Um, but that little person, it has like a bit of personality to it. And that wasn't me. That was the yeast. <laughs> uh, it came out of the oven with like a little bit of extra. Um, and Baha Alotcha, a Parsha not too far away from there, the challah is, it's a bunch of these little tiny quail, um, which were such fun to make. Long side tangent, but some other images that I think are cool. I'll tell you one that's new for the book. So my favorite one is the one I made for Brashit, the very first portion in Torah, in the story of creation. And so it is a challah that is made up of seven different braids, all laid out next to each other. Each one, the number of strands that makes up the braid is the day of creation in the first creation story in Genesis 1. And each one of them has imagery painted onto the braid that tells you a little bit about what's going on on each of the days. So far, pretty easy. The first one, it's just a single strand, dark and light. Um, and then we'll we'll move through the story of creation. But then the last one, and this is where it's fun, the last one, the seven-stranded braid, which is Shabbat, the seventh day, the day of rest, that one starts to open up some questions. Why is it blank? So whereas all the other ones have, they're telling you something about what's happening on these days, there's nothing there. So you could say, oh, it's because God rested, seventh day, day of rest, Shabbat. Or there's something else going on there. And so it's an invitation to start saying, well, what exactly is Shabbat? Is Shabbat a creation? Is it not a creation? What is happening on that day? And so that's that's also a little space that invites the viewer in to do a little bit of their own interpretation. Some of them are also very abstract. Um, for Parshat Bo, it's a it's actually a chocolate holiday, so it's very, very dark. Um, this is the one of the Parsha where we get the the plagues, the 10 plagues on Egypt, including the plague of darkness, which is one that I've always been intrigued by. And so you have to really like look deep into this image and the shapes are completely abstract. Um, and so this is one that's really, it's a little bit like a Rorschach test. <laughs> and so this is one that really is asking the reader to do some interpretive work and say, what, what is going on in here? So can you talk a little bit about like, how do you go about getting to a point where you know what challah you want to make? In general, I always start by reading the Torah portion itself. And so I'll sit down. So when I was doing this project, I knew I had to have the image ready by Friday. So Sunday, I sat down with um, opened up Safaria and started reading the portion. Again, instead of what I would be looking for if I were going to create a Torah study discussion or write a sermon, I was really looking for something different to jump out from the text. And in this case, I was looking for either a very strong image or a strong word or abstract concept, trying to really keep it simple down to one thing. The format that I was using was image, one verse, and then very short commentary. So I really had to stay focused on one area. And so that's why you'll see some of them are these kind of very recognizable moments like, oh, there's Joseph's coat. And sometimes it's something a little more out there, just depending on what spoke to me in that study that read. Then uh, a little bit later in the week, I would make my make my holiday. And then the real creative process would happen once the dough had gone through its first rise and it was ready to shape. Challah dough really is a, it's a chevruta, it's a creative study partner in this endeavor. So the balance between what I was bringing and what the dough was bringing on a given day would, would shift, just kind of depending on what was going on. So some days I came to the dough with a clear vision in mind and a clear intention and shaped away and there it was. In other cases, and I think ones that often led to the more interesting halot, I didn't have an idea. I got there and was like, okay, I know the verse, but I don't know what I want to make. And I would just start to shape. I would just start to play with the dough. I would get it in my hands. I start rolling and seeing what starts to take shape. That's one of the, the parts of the creative process that I really try to lean into when I teach this now is that the process itself is actually much more important than the product. It's really the process of getting there. It's that process of study, of kind of marinating on the ideas, and then getting to the dough and letting my hands do the last step of the thinking, allowing myself to be inspired by the dough. What was the dough feeling and what was it doing that day? As I say this, it might sound a little bit crazy. You're like, the dough, the dough had thoughts? Yeah, it really did. When you're working with a material, especially a material you get to know well, you can be led by it too. And so there are certain certain images that really, I did not have any idea what I was doing when I got to the dough. And it was a kind of a co-creative process to get to the final result. No, I think it's amazing to think about the dough as a creative partner, the yeast as a creative partner. It's it's fascinating to to think about it that way. Having done this for a long time, 
And also having brought others along or, you know, at least starting to imagine that others that others are reading this book. And again, the way that really struck me was that the book isn't saying everybody go out there and let's make challah based Judaism, the new kind of Judaism where everybody's making interpretive challahs. It's really calling on people to a different stance with Judaism, one that brings you into a creative relationship with Judaism. So in a sense, I guess you're the yeast, uh, you know, other people, people mm-hmm. become the yeast, you know, become part of this process. Is, is there a sense that you could talk about your own life or what you've observed in others that like, what does it look like to have a life where my relationship with the material of Judaism is fundamentally a creative one, as opposed to, I think, what other people think of it as like, my relationship is that I'm supposed to do certain things or I'm supposed to go to certain places. But what does that stance bring you to in terms of how you live that Jewish life? I have a little bit of an advantage here in that I am coming from a liberal denomination. I'm a reform rabbi. And so I am very much guided by those kinds of structures, Jewish law that has shaped our people for a long time. And at the same time, I'm very much guided by another equally important and ancient trend within Judaism, which is that in every generation, we reinvent what Judaism looks like, feels like, and is. Each one of us has a role to play in ensuring that we are creating the next version of Judaism that is one that is compelling, one that's going to continue on after us, knowing that the next generation is going to change it too. For me, having that invitation, even that imperative, to create a Judaism that is meaningful and relevant and inspiring for me, and then also in my context as a communal leader, that is for my community as well. Having that joy, that sense that, no, I have something in my hands that is meaningful, it is powerful, it has survived millennia, and now it's mine, and I get to make it mine. I get to make it speak to my life to bring something meaningful and important to the world around me. It's beautiful. I have a, I know I have a responsibility. And at the same time, it means I'm creating rituals that are, um, that are personalized, that are fun. And then I'm inviting other people to be able to, um, to do that for themselves as well. So we've had a number of moments in this show where we think about different kinds of yearly cycles that might be good for Jews to have, like, like, like putting on like educator hat again. I think one of the smartest things that Judaism ever did, to the extent Judaism does things, which I don't really think it does, but it's good that Jewish history evolved such that we have a weekly pedagogical tool that is the Torah portion. We take it for granted. We don't talk about how that's actually a choice, that like we could just have a big book or five books of Moses, and it could be that we have a relationship to that book, but it's not broken down into 54 pieces and we just have to sort of have a relationship to it without that tool of breaking it down into pieces and time slots over the course of the year. That is really smart if you want people to have a relationship to the scope of that book to say, you know, we understand that certain parts of any book are more exciting. There's going to be people that want to talk more about Noah's Ark than are going to want to talk about the skin diseases in Leviticus. And so we're going to take a step that says, by the calendar, every single part of this book is going to have a moment. That is exciting and good that we took this big set of text and broke it down into pieces for us to relate to. What it leaves me with is there's a heck of a lot of Jewish stuff we haven't done that with. We have not said, here's a rough canon of meaningful, important Jewish episodes of TV shows. Let's have one for every week of the year. Here, I mean, to go to the Midrash manicures, here's, I mean, that ties to the Torah portion, but like, here's ways that we can do nail art to every week of the year to tie to different Jewish themes. Here's, I mean, you could pick any realm of Jewish life and try to break it down into weeks of the year or months of the year. And I think that would serve us because, again, we are not good as human beings at taking like massive amounts of material and just like, building a relationship to it. That's why the vast majority of sermons, they're not actually a summary of the whole Torah portion. They're like, here's one verse, and I'm going to talk about that. Because we can't handle anything more than that. So I guess I'd I'd love to hear from you, like, if your book is a model, if it's not just, hey, everyone, here's examples of good chalas, or even here's an example of a practice, now make your chalas, but it's broader than that. Do, Do creative things with the Torah portion. Like, 
what are some of the kinds of things people might do after reading your book that are not challah related, but are sort of aligned with how you understand this book's purpose? I love the idea of creating our own kinds of cycles. Right. I leaned into two very common ones that take us through the year um, because, again, they are incredible pedagogical tools. And when we think about I, the, the book is in two sections, there's the Torah reading cycle and then there's also the cycle of the Jewish calendar. So the months and the major holidays, because there are these different ways that we live through the year and that the, the calendar invites us to experience the same basic material over and over again, but as we, of course, change every time we come to it. And so we get something different out of it every time. There's so many different ways that we can create our own practices based on something that's that's of interest to us that we want to be able to explore more deeply. The practice, tikkun midot, um, basically think of different soul traits or attributes that you could, if you wanted to take on a study or practice of something like tikkun midot, setting up your own structure for studying it. Again, it can be through a traditional means like, oh, okay, I'm going to read the following books. I'm going to break them up into chapters. But creating something that really, that fits with something you enjoy doing and that you love. I think that's what I was trying to do with this Hala project was really to say like, this is something I'm, I want to do more of. I enjoy doing it. And how can I apply it to something that has this kind of regular cycle? Shabbat is a great way to do that. Shabbat comes every single week. It's always going to come at the same time. Well, roughly the same time. But I think the answer has to be very personal to each person. So part of what leads me to this question about finding other cycles is a core premise of how I live my Judaism, which is that Judaism lives everywhere. There is Torah everywhere. And I mean that like like literally every room of your house, every street corner, like, like there is potential Torah to be unlocked in all of those places. And so what I see your book as doing is, yes, We've uh, like we usually unlock the Torah that we find when we when we're in libraries together or we're in synagogue sanctuaries together. That those are like the spaces that we are as a Jewish collective best at channeling Torah. This is the kitchen room book or one potential. I, I think there's many kitchen kinds of books where you unlock the Torah of that space. Part of why I went to like TV shows. That's the living room. I think somebody could create a bathroom cycle that is like, here's poems or really short things that are literally designed to be bathroom reading. Not that they necessarily tie to every Torah portion, but that they tie to a yearly cycle that this one is a good poem to read in December. This is a good poem to read in May for whatever set of reasons. That's kind of where I'm coming from. And I'm curious, I mean, if if that's not the, the angle that you were thinking about with this book, that's totally fine. But from my perspective, one of the superpowers of this book is that it plants a seed for us to find deep Jewish meaning in spaces outside of just you know, a Beit Midrash, a library, a, a sermon module where somebody is standing at a lectern and saying stuff. We, we can find it with our hands, you know, mixing around in dough. I think that's exactly right. The idea of Judaism is not something that is just supposed to live in, in a synagogue, in a Beit Midrash, that we go in, we do our Jewish, and then we leave and we're not doing our Jewish anymore. That's absolutely not true. We do have so many rituals that are designed for the home. And so the home is is the natural next place. For instance, like you were just saying, challah, the kitchen, the home, the kitchen, the table in particular um, is really where this kind of project shines, the idea that we're bringing Torah to the table in the form of food. But Judaism is in all the things we do. It's in the work that we do in the world, whether that's paid work or whether that's um, a broader understanding of the work that we do. What is it that we contribute to the world? Judaism is something that should be informing all of those different things. And it can be found in all of those different things, as you were saying. That's that's another an invitation to say, where where can I find this in my life? Where in the in the work that I'm doing, where where do I see glimmers of Torah? Where might I be able to apply elements of my Jewish life, Jewish practice, whether it's those kinds of like I have this beautiful rhythm of study or of ritual that I have from somewhere that I can bring that idea into another place in my life that maybe I don't think of it as being Jewish, but it certainly can be. Being Jewish is part of our whole selves. It's not just something we do sometimes and leave aside at others. When we think about bringing Judaism everywhere, one of the things that I think about in terms of a project that's making Judaism out of challah or challah out of Judaism, however you want to put it, is the question of whether challah itself is Jewish. 
And I have so many experiences where a friend of mine goes to visit Germany and comes back saying, oh my gosh, like challah is the national bread of Germany. Like that's just what we call challah, they call bread. It becomes clear that it's not that our ancestors were sitting around the Middle East eating challah as we know it, that when they talked about the term challah, they probably meant something more like a pita bread. Mm -hmm. And so this food that is probably much more of a European non-Jewish food in its origins is become the most Jewish food that most people can imagine. And I'm curious if you could tell us some more about, you know, the story of challah and what makes it Jewish. Absolutely. So the long version with all the good footnotes is in the book. So I am going to make you go to the book itself for the whole version, but I'll give you the short version. Um, it's got which, a demon, which is pretty exciting. So really read it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, there's some good stuff in there. So we do start, of course, with Hala is um, Hala gets its name actually from Torah. And it's it comes from something that we remove actually from the dough where we get the name for Hala is from a traditional tithe, like a tax that was given to the priests. And so the name for Hala comes from this tithing practice that we read about in the book of Numbers, that eventually is going to be mapped onto this particular bread, but that mapping is going to happen later on in time. And so we do start with bread as something that's more like a flatbread. We might think matzah, we might think pita. Challah, we think biblically, was more like pita. The fact that it was, um, it had some hollowness to it, that it was risen slightly, that was pretty big bread technology at the time. So this was our fancy bread. We have bread that was offered and kept on the altar as part of Israelite sacrificial practice, Israelite practice for much of biblical history and a little bit of post-biblical history. And we pull different pieces of these biblical elements into what will become our bread today. So there used to be these 12 show breads that were stacked on the altar, 12, one for each of the tribes. Today, we will often see two six-stranded breads brought together in a in Ashkenazi or European-based tradition, or 12 flatbreads in many Mizrahi or Sephardi traditions. There are different, many different traditions around the Jewish world about your Shabbat and holiday bread. It doesn't all look like the braided bread with the lacquered crust that became common through Ashkenazi Jews brought to the United States and brought to Israel also. That shape, that braided shape, does in fact come from Germany. We're thinking about 14th, 15th century, where there was a, a German pagan bread making tradition where they would make this braided bread for basically this, this demon figure. You'd throw it into the fire to kind of ward her off. Um, but the Jews looked at him and were like, oh, hey, that's kind of cool. Turns out it keeps the bread fresh for longer also in that state, and it looks a little elevated. And again, the idea is that on Shabbat, this is a special day of the week. We're trying to elevate it. And so we're going to use our fanciest flour for our bread. People would save all week for a little white flour to make into their challah. White flour is very expensive at the time. And then we start seeing other expensive ingredients added into that mix. Eggs were really expensive. Sugar was really expensive. As Ashkenazi Jews began to be able to acquire these ingredients more readily, we start adding them into our bread, and eventually we get to this very rich, eggy, sweet bread um, with the braided form that we are used to today. The more elaborate shaping traditions start to emerge later. Some of them come from the fact that most bread was baked in communal ovens. And so you would bring your shaped bread to the big giant community oven and you wanted to be able to get your bread back. So you would shape it a little bit differently from your neighbors. Um, and so we'd start to get these different interpretations. And then we also start to see, particularly in the Ukraine around the eight, 17th, 18th century, some different shaping traditions that evolve for different holidays. Some of the origin story of how we get to the challah that we think of today, and that's now ubiquitous in grocery stores and diner French toast. It does have a, a very a Jewish history and it tells the story of both the, the biblical connections and then also the many places that the Jewish diaspora has taken us. Yeah, I also think it's like the typical Jewish failure to fully contend with the public relations issues related to eating a demon bread. <laughs> I mean, I think a demon bread's a pretty cool I, thing. I, I only want to eat demon bread. Now, <laughs> now that I know demon bread exists and there, and there are categories that are demon bread and non-demon bread, I'm pretty ideologically aligned with only having demon bread. I feel like that should be a new kashrut system, a new kosher keeping uh, system. <laughs> but uh, I, I, you all decide if I'm joking out there, listeners. I'm, I'm not sure if I am. But um, I have a, a different question, which 
relates to feminist scholarship, which maybe that feels out of left field. Maybe to a lot of listeners, you're like, yep, that makes abundant sense to me. Um, I think there's something interesting that we should look at here. When you talk to folks who do scholarship of, you know, whether it's Jewish feminism or otherwise, often what people talk about is, let's take Jewish life as an example. At first, what people spent a lot of time and spend a lot of time doing is making sure that women have the right to do the things that men have had the right to do, that that non-men get to do that. That is an important, vital, crucial step. What then often happens is that you move beyond women and non-binary folks should be allowed to do the things that men do to a stage of, oh, we've actually defined what Jewish life is on terms that men came up with. And so we need to back out and not just allow women to do those men-defined things, but say that this is a broader, that, that Judaism, that Jewish life, that Jewish learning, that Torah commentaries are a broader set of things than we thought. They're not just words written on pages that talk about previous words written on pages. They're a, they're a broader set of, of ideas, including challah that is made creatively and that we code in our heads problematically but that we do code in our heads as gendered women or gendered non-male because it does happen in a kitchen that we've associated with not men. There's a beautiful, wonderful book that came out a a few decades ago called Torah, A Women's Commentary. It was published by the same publisher that published your book. And I think, and, and I'm not saying this to disparage that commentary. I think it is one of the most important books of my lifetime. I do think it was my lifetime. I think it was like 90s or early 2000s. That book was important, but it was very much like, we're going to do a Torah commentary that looks pretty similar to other Torah commentaries that have existed for a long time. It's going to have the Torah text in the middle. There's going to be people in the margins saying stuff about that Torah text, and it's going to be women. It's not just going to be men. It's going to be, at the time, they they were not saying non-binary folks, but like it would be non-men. I see your book as kind of serving a role parallel to that next step of feminism, which is, oh, we actually want to think of what a Torah commentary is in a much broader set of ways beyond words commentating on words. So I guess I'm curious to to ask you a little bit about the gender dynamics of this, because my sense is that it's not an accident that you wrote this book and that, that CCIR is publishing it. Like, I think there's a general sense that we need to do collective Jewish work to redefine things like Torah commentaries, things like our rituals, that, and, and not just say, oh, non-men, you're sort of allowed to do the things that men have been doing for a long time. Absolutely. And I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, and just to chime in extra love to the Torah, a women's commentary, which was written by my teachers and Rabbi Andrea Weiss, who's one of the one of the editors of that book, um, also one of the blurbers on my book, a big supporter of this project. I learned so much from the Torah women's commentary. And I, I do think that we we're seeing kind of the the waves of feminism, right? The second, third wave feminism of, you know, women can do all the things that men can do. I stand very much on the shoulders of the the women who paved that path for me to be able to do this. And then also taking on, I see this project very much as a fourth wave feminist project in the act of reclaiming something that has that very gendered quality. And to back up for a second, thinking about traditionally, what were the mitzvot, the commandments that women were obligated in, and in some respects, confined to. Those were lighting Shabbat candles or holiday candles, family purity, mikvah, and taking challah. So again, the mitzvah of challah, the commandment of challah is actually to remove a small piece as a symbolic tithe from a batch of dough. That's the mitzvah part. Um, And so actually, there's a whole bunch of really cool rituals that evolved because this was this was an outlet for women's spiritual practice when there were so few. And so there's actually a lot of really beautiful rituals around that moment of hafrashat challah, of separating out the challah, the tithe. But for me, taking that medium, holodo, that act that has been traditionally coded as a limited feminine space, and then using it as the medium to do what men traditionally did at the Shabbat table, which is to bring the words of Torah, to bring the Devar Torah, to have the hala be the medium for bringing Torah to the table, is that radical act of saying, not only can women do the things that men can do, but we can we can 
break down that binary even further and say, why shouldn't men be using Hala as a way to um, to create and to teach Torah just as much, right? That this is, why does this have to have such a gendered lens to it? It does, of course, because we live in a world in which there is still patriarchy and gendered lenses, um, but that this is one of the steps in trying to break that distinction down a little bit more. And Another piece of this book that's important to me is that there's a lot of really incredible, beautiful challah related work in the Jewish world. Much of it does come from a traditional perspective. For me, having a liberal Jewish voice in this space and many of the commentaries throughout the book do have a feminist bent, um, that that's also an important thing as well to be able to say, like, look, this isn't an explicitly feminist commentary. But guess what? You're going to get some feminist Torah in here. It is doing a bit of that blending work and also saying multiple points of access. That is another big feminist principle here that we all have different ways that we can approach ideas, different valuable forms of contribution, um, and that we shouldn't dismiss something because it looks pretty. Um, we shouldn't diminish it. That is a, a valuable way to approach something as serious as Torah. When I first heard about this project, I was sort of imagining in my head the objections, the notion that people will say, oh, what is, we're going to make the future of Judaism based on challah decoration? You know, that same way that I was joking earlier that, you know, people saying now it's all about Torah on your fingernails. And um, and I've been saying for, for so long, these new ideas, if you judge them based on what they are today, you're going to destroy a lot of great ideas before they've had a chance to evolve into something much more significant. And, and again, that's why I know I keep coming back to it, but it's why I really appreciated so much in the book how it wasn't just restricted to challah. When you really read the, the writing in the book, it was clear that the challah is an example. And I'm curious if you could talk about, I guess what I'm asking is for the person who is brave enough to imagine a Torah commentary based on challah design. Can you share with us some of your speculations and dreams about the future of Judaism, where this all might lead into a place that would be really exciting to you? What's a future that you think might be unleashed by this kind of thinking? Mm -hmm. What a beautiful thing to think about. I think one of the things that's most important to me in creating this book and in giving that invitation to find your own way into the text is really to try to break down the the sense that, oh, I don't know enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not a good enough Jew that is given with air quotes to be able to read this text on my own, to have something to say about it, to be able to interpret it. I really, I so want to break that down because Torah is at its most beautiful and its most enduring when it's something that each person takes into their hands and shapes for themselves. My beautiful vision is that we will have a world where we don't have the same distinctions of who gets to be a teacher of Torah, that teachers of Torah come from everywhere, that we're turning to our children to teach us Torah, that we're turning to people from all different backgrounds to teach us Torah, that that doesn't just live in the hands of rabbis, cantors, and educators, but really that this is democratized Torah in the best way. The story that I love most and that I, I use to exemplify this is um, there's a beautiful midrash on the story of Sinai, the moment when the when the Jewish people receive Torah and enter into a covenant with the divine for the first time. Um, and there's a midrash, an interpretation of the story that says that God spoke to each person at Sinai in a language that that they could best understand and that we can take that one more step to say that only they could understand. And if each and every Jewish person who ever was and ever will be was present that day, that each one of us got a different little piece of Torah that nobody else has access to. And so we each need to be able to contribute that piece of Torah in order to make revelation and our relationship with God as a people whole. I want to see a Judaism where everyone feels empowered to be able to articulate and teach that piece of Torah and to weave it into our, our greater story. So I want to close by returning to Dan's question that I think of as the Jewification question. Chala was bread, and then it was Jewish bread, historically. that <laughs> There was a thing that was just bread, and we as a Jewish collective waved our collective magic wands. We didn't 
wave literal wands, but we we did a set of magical acts, and I do in fact think that they are magical by most meanings of magical. And we made something <laughs> transform from a status of not Jewish in any particular way to Jewish in a particular way, but not only Jewish, like paradigmatically Jewish to the point that it would be a symbol on like Jewish bumper stickers. Like if you made, if you were to pick your most known Jewish symbols and list them, I don't think Hala would be first, but I think Hala would be like, I don't know, fourth or fifth. Like, yeah, I was going to say like three to five. Yeah. Like throw in your <laughs> Star of David, your menorah. I think those are probably the top few, but then like Chala's up there. If you weren't allowed to use the uh, a Star of David or Menorah and you had to convey Jewish in a picture, Chala would be a pretty good way to do it. And that's only the case because we waved our collective magic wands and made something that everybody looked at and said, that's just bread. That's just food that people eat, not a particular group of people. And we made it us related. I think when people hear that, whether they hear it about challah or they hear it about like matzah ball soup, which has a similar story. Yes, matzah is like has a lot of Jewish history, but like there were soups that were like that in your like but most foods, especially Ashkenazi foods, but even globally Jewish foods started as food for everyone, and in many places still are food for everyone. But we have coded them as Jewish. We've done this with like fruit slices. I, if you show me those fruit slices in November that people eat around Passover time that are branded as Manischewitz. If you show me f- fruit slices that are not Manischewitz brand, that are just general sl- fruit slices, I'm going to see them and I'm going to think of them as Jewish. It doesn't matter to me if they're branded for everybody. Like, it's just that we've decided that those fruit slices are kind of coded Jewish. And I bring those up because they're like a newer version. I want us to see that as a feature and not a bug. I think so often mm-hmm. people hear this with challah or matzah soup or fruit slices, and they're like, wow, what an interesting like outlier. Most of the time, stuff is Jewish all along, and we just keep it Jewish. No, just about everything, including our core narratives, and we could talk about how the Noah's Ark story that we started with, there's a lot of evidence that that started as a not Jewish or not Israelite story that we then mapped onto our society. Now, is that cultural appropriation? Maybe. It's cultural appropriation that turned into Judaism eventually. So I kind of am just wondering like, how we can think about this as something to strive for, not just something that happens to happen. Like, oh, interesting. There was bread on the shelves in Germany and Poland. It was tied to this cool demony figure. We thought that was interesting. A thing your book mentions is that the word for it, which is like hala it, without the ch, sounds mm-hmm. a lot like hala in Hebrew. So we, we made a connection there. Cool. How can we actually strive to make that something we do? And I'm not advocating for like cultural appropriation and like grabbing other people's symbols and saying they're ours. But I am mm-hmm. saying with things that are sort of everyone's, that are just like at a Walmart, I actually do think that the act of saying you know, those fruit slices or this object or whatever, we're going to find layers of Jewish meaning for it. I think that's an unbelievably important act because it sends the message to everyone that what Judaism is at any given time is ours to define. And Mm -hmm. it endures in a long line of Jewish groups and individuals who have done that throughout history. And so as a closing question, like, how might we replicate this process where German Polish bread becomes German Polish Jewish bread, but not just in a European, not just in an Ashkenazi context. How might we actually see that as part of what it means to be Jewish and a responsibility we all have, not just like a thing that happens to happen? I love this idea because it is so connected to the sense that Judaism is not something that just lives in these very particular places or moments in time, but that it's something that is part of our our whole life in the mo- the extraordinary moments and the ordinary moments the ordinary objects and the and the special ones i think it's really the key is in how we use it right so what one of the things that makes a jewish challah different from the when i lived in astoria a greek neighborhood in new york they also have a tradition of making a braided bread and like what is it that makes the challah in the jewish bakery different from the braided bread in the greek bakery next door it's also in how we use it right that our that challah is part of a meaningful set of ritual that we were inheriting and also creating and making our own when we observe shabbat um or create shabbat for ourselves or or another holiday table spread whatever it might be and that we say 
blessings traditionally? What is it that turns that bread from just being bread into like Jewish bread? I think part of it is also in the ritual and in the act of blessing and bringing meaning onto this inert object that in and of itself, it's carrying all these layers of symbolism and all that good stuff if we have that and if we're putting it there. But at the end of the day, it is just a piece of bread. Um, It's a loaf of bread. So we also transform that object through our intention that when we say a blessing, it's a way of, of stopping and noticing and saying, there's something extraordinary in this ordinary thing. So we can do that with so many different things in our lives. And some of them will have we can tie them back to something in Torah. There's all kinds of great stuff about clothing. If you're a fashion person, that's that's your thing, um, that we can create connections that make our clothing feel more Jewish, even if it's not like, you know, plastered with some slogan or Star of David or or whatever it might be, that there's there's some even down to the threads itself. We can give that level of intention if we want to make meaning in something. We have that power. It doesn't live in the object, but it lives in us. And I would be excited to see all the the different kinds of connections that could be built from taking the ordinary markers of our lives and turning them into something extraordinary and meaningful, and hopefully also a little more Jewish. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for joining us. This has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. And thanks so much to all of you out there for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation, and we hope that you'll tune in again in the future. A reminder, we've got some amazing Judaism Unbound courses in the On Yeshiva being offered. And uh, they start in just a few weeks. So you need to go. I mean, you don't need to, but you are strongly encouraged. Your life might be a little more amazing if you do go to judaismunbound.com slash classes, check out those courses, find one that feels like a good fit and sign up or find five that feel like a good fit and sign up. So we hope that you'll do that. I'm teaching a course. Dan's co-teaching a course with Miriam Terlinchamp, our executive director. Three other amazing course options coming your way. We hope that you will go and register for them. As a closing note, we really, really are appreciative always when you are in touch with us with your questions, your ideas, your visions, especially given the content of this episode. If you've got ideas for some creative Torah commentary that wouldn't be challah necessarily, but would be some other take on the Torah portions or on the cycle of the Jewish year, please be in touch with us. You can do so in a whole bunch of different ways. You can head to our Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram handles. All of those are at Judaism Unbound. You can visit our website, JudaismUnbound.com, where you can find show notes for this episode, all sorts of other resources, and the aforementioned Anishiva classes. You can email us at Dan at JudaismUnbound.com or Lex at JudaismUnbound.com. And this isn't so much being in touch with us, but we are greatly appreciative if you are able to support us financially with either a monthly recurring gift or a one-time donation, which you can do at JudaismUnbound.com slash donate. So thank you so much for listening. And with that, this has been Judaism Unbound.